Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, we have hopefully a uh, really, not hopefully, I know we have, <laughs> um, a very uh, interesting uh, program for you tonight. Um, first of all, I wanted to thank our sponsors. The Barbara, Barbara and Richard Rosenberg have sponsored this event here and we're very grateful for their uh, support. Uh, and they wish they could be here tonight. They send their greetings. Uh, unfortunately, they can't be with us, but they're very excited about the program we're gonna have tonight. So thank you to our, our uh, benefactors. So this is an interesting night. We've had a big change uh, in the world, uh, and it uh, affects what we do here very much. We, um, we study the science of the sea, um, and we study the way climate affects the science of the sea. That's one of our themes. We study the San Francisco Bay Estuary. We're concerned about the impacts of sea level rise. Um, we train students from San Francisco State University uh, in undergraduate and graduate programs in envir environmental science. Uh, and we think a lot about the issues that are confronting the Bay Area and that are confronting the globe and the planet and the ocean. Um, so I, I really need to say a few words and I'm gonna quote some of the responses from the scientific community uh, from an article in the Washington Post today. One of the concerns that uh, come out of the American Physical Society, for example, is that Trump will be the first anti-science president we have ever had. Um, chief among si many scientists' concerns is Trump's stance on climate change. As a candidate, he vowed to cancel the Pir Paris Climate Agreement that was signed earlier this year and pledged to eliminate environmental regulations. Uh, a colleague at Columbia University who teaches, uh, is teaching a class right now says, the class I'm teaching right now is coastal and estuarine ecology. That's something very close to our, near to, dear to our hearts here. Uh, we cover a lot of topics, including global climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification. The fact that Trump doesn't believe in this does not bode well for uh, having the US policy that addresses these issues. Um, there's also great concern for funding for science in general. Um, there's a real concern in the community for what it might mean. Uh, it's clear that the public scientific method is not embraced uh, based on past comments. Now, we'll see. We don't know. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to start us on the path because really federal funding is very important. It's the lifeblood of what we do here. The majority of our funding for our research comes from federal sources, as it does at every university in the nation, really. That's a big source of funding for scientific research. So uh, those are just some of our concerns. Uh, on a better note, um, there's never been a more important time for the work that we do here at the center or the work that we do at San Francisco State University. We have one of the most diverse student bodies in the nation uh, and we treasure and value that diversity and we, um, we, are, we embrace our community and we hope all of you will as well and we know you will and uh, we have a lot of work to do. So it's never been more important than to keep uh, keep faith and keep moving forward with our uh, science and with our research and with our education. On that note, I'm going to switch now. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight who is amazing. His name is Dr. Rashid Smila, and he told me the way that I uh, can remember how to pronounce his name correctly is to remember to smile. And as all of you know, that when you smile, there's actually a physiological response. You do, there are hormones released and you start to feel better. So let's all smile. <laughs> um, Dr. Smila is a professor and director of fisheries economics research uh, at the fisheries Econom sorry, economics research unit at the University of British Columbia in the fisheries center. Uh, he has his PhD and Master of Science in Economics from the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree from Amadou Bello University in Nigeria, and that was in an engineering field. So uh, he came to uh, biology, ecology, economics of that through uh, uh, engineering, and it was very interesting to hear his take on how that led him to economics, and then how economics led him to ecology. Uh, his specialty is bioeconomics uh, and the analysis of global issues, as we're going to talk about today a little bit, such as fisheries. A topic that he also touches on a lot is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, uh, and basically focus on the high seas and the deep seas fisheries. He's worked in Norway, 
in Canada, in uh, the North Atlantic, in Namibia, in Southern Africa, uh, Ghana, um, Hong Kong, and the South China Sea. For, uh, so he's a real international uh, expert. Uh, the courses that he teaches focus on the areas of environmental uh, natural resource economics, applied game theory. You can ask about that. That applies in evolutionary biology too, so a lot of us will be familiar with that in the, in the biology crowd. Uh, in fisheries economics, as we said. He's won uh, several awards. Uh, he most recently, an American Fisheries Society uh, Award for Excellence in Public Outreach. Uh, he has a Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies uh, from an International Roundtable Award. Uh, he uh, has, uh, in 2010, was, had the top, was in the top 10 for most cited articles in the Journal of Environmental uh, Economics and Management, highly cited. Uh, 2008, he was awarded a Pew Marine Conservation uh, Fellow. Um, Dr. Smile is a prolific scholar. He's very published widely. I'm not going to uh, go on and on, but uh, very prolific uh, scholar. He's published in journals like Science, Nature, and then the journals that are related to the discipline. Um, and his work has drawn an enormous amount of interest and been cited uh, in the international press, the national press, and in the Canadian press, local press. So he speaks to the press a lot. I looked at his resume, and he has lots of public communications in there. So. Um, without further ado, um, I would like to welcome Dr. Smila and introduce his talk, which is going to be entitled Towards a Sustainable Global Ocean. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, yeah, anytime somebody reads your bio, you kind of feel, my God. Did I actually do this? That was how I felt, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Karina, for that. And thanks for the Institute, for the sponsors, for inviting me. It's such a, a privilege to get the chance to present to a group like you. I really take that close to heart, me. And as an economist, I know that your know, time is valuable. The opportunity cost of your one hour with me is high. I can, <laughs> if I calculate that, my God. So, so thank you so much for for coming out, and uh, 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 we're going to talk about the global ocean. And uh, at the Fisheries Center, my group, and the group of uh, Daniel Pauli and that of William Chang, we try to look at the ocean as a system, the global ocean system, because of the interconnectivity. I mean, if you ca if you look at it closely, it's actually we have one global ocean, and this is what drives our work. You know. And I think this is also what uh, made uh, Senator John Kerry to get involved with the, uh, the State Department in fisheries, organize our oceans conference. We don't know what will happen with that now, you know, unfortunately. But, but he, he said, look, this is not just about other departments. The State Department and foreign ministries around the world have a role to play to ensure that our oceans are sustainable. And, and so, that is the, the, the way we look at it. So I'll be talking a lot about global stuff. Now, the first question, uh, this is the outline. So first of all, I'll look at how important are the oceans to us. And, and I know you know a lot about how important they are, but it's good to say this and, uh, again. And then I ask the question, are our interactions with the ocean, are they sustainable? And I'm sorry to say, in general, they are not. And we'll talk about that. Then, what is the cost in economic terms and social terms of this unsustainability, the way we are taking down life in the ocean? What are the costs and benefits of that? Then I, I, I conclude with a few uh, kind of uh, points about how I feel we could start moving towards a sustainable global ocean. Now, a few, a few numbers that you, I'm sure you've heard, some of you have heard about. 60% of the world's population lives within 60 kilometers of the coast. And this is increasing as we are talking. In fact, predictions are that about a three quarters of the world will live along that. Think of climate change, and sea level rise, and all that, what, what this could mean. And 50% of uh, oxygen comes from the ocean. In one talk, I said the ocean is our life. Because if 50% of the oxygen we take, that means half of our life. But what is half a life? Nothing, right? So the ocean is our life, yeah. Yeah, so. 
And, and it regulates the F system, uh, science tells us that, and it's crucial for the balance and the survival of the planet, actually. It's, it's, it's the largest part of the planet, if you, if you look at it in terms of volume in particular. Now, it's very valuable, cultural and spiritual value. I had a PhD student, Nigel uh, Hagen, who actually looked at the spiritual value of fish to the coastal communities in BC. Uh, thinking of uh, First Nations, Aboriginal peoples, and, uh, and non-Aboriginal peoples, so it's important. Some just go to take a dive and they feel so good, right? You probably have done it before, especially, especially when it's hot. You dive and, and that, that means a lot. Transport and shipping is big, just here, all right? There's a lot of it going on. And it supports jobs. I'll give you a few job numbers in the next few slides. And I, I, I take that really seriously. And of course, it feeds a lot of people. We get protein, animal protein. In some parts of the world, that's the only animal protein they get to eat. And in other parts, it's still valuable, like here, micronutrients, and it's just good protein, right? And we like to eat it, so one good reason why we should keep it going. Now, if you look at fish stocks, you put them at the center of this universe here. They connect so much, I mean, and, and capture fisheries, we know, you go and catch wild fish, that is what most people connect to the fish store. But think of agriculture. Agriculture is, uh, there are many among us who think agriculture can solve all our problems. We can forget wild fish and we farm everything. In fact, there was a time I gave a talk and somebody came to me and said, you know, Rashid, why do you care about wild fish? I said, why not? And he said, you know, we can build, we can, we can, farm all the fish we need in the world in one high-rise building in Holland, he told me. <laughs> in Holland. I said, why? Why Holland? So I went and did some checking. Actually, they do a lot of animal husbandry in, in, in high-rise buildings, pigs and so on, they farm them. But this guy, of course, doesn't understand that. The high-rise building will not give you all the inputs you need to do this farming. Inputs have to come from some water and so on. And after you've done all that, You've got some waste that you have to throw away. The, the high rise will not just swallow them up. It actually turns out that in Holland, one of the problems they have farming animals in the high rise building is where to dispose the pea from the pigs. Sorry, I had to say that, right? <laughs> so they have them in containers because it pollutes the land and affects the agricultural sector. So, you know, high rise doesn't make fish really. I mean, you have to have inputs. And that is the connection to agriculture. We we normally will ground uh, small fish like anchovies and fish salmon and so on and so forth. So there's connections there. And, and space is an issue, water is an issue. So uh, there's no free lunch, essentially. So, and we have to do agriculture carefully for it to be sustainable. And there are other things going around the fish. For example, research. Many of us in this room would have to look for a different job without the fish, right? So there you go. I don't know how easy or difficult, but. <laughs> we'll have so there's a lot connected to fish and it's important that we keep life in the ocean alive. We don't kill the the dead ocean is not something we should think about. Let, now some numbers for you. It is estimated that the least estimate is that we take about one hundred and thirty million tons of fish each year from the ocean. One hundred thirty, both legally and illegally. Reported and unreported, one hundred thirty million tons of fish. Just to give you an idea of what this means in terms of mass and weight, if you convert this to number of mature cows, that will be at least 130 million mature cows that we pull out of the ocean. Oh, cow, ocean, fish cows, right? <laughs> 130 million, that is seriously. And so when you think of it in terms of food security, that's a lot. But also in terms of the ecosystem, think about it. What system can continue to sustain that amount of biomass being taken out of it, right? So, 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 yeah, it's huge. But then there's food. I mentioned that, micronutrients. Many people in West Africa, for example, live not for fish. They wouldn't have protein in their diets. Southeast Asia, right? So, so this is important. Uh, and there are numbers, 3 billion people get at least 15% of their dietary animal protein from fish. And it's, this is even more so in low-income uh, low food deficit countries. And uh, 
And so you may wonder why should you worry if you're in Vancouver or in, in, in San Francisco? Why do you worry about people in West Africa or Southeast Asia, right? Uh, I'm sure uh, the new president-elect would ask that question. But really, there are connections. Yeah. And, uh, and I'll give an example as we, we go. In terms of raw cash, that's about, if you think of the, um, the value of the fish at the dock, right? At the dock, it's about $120 billion. So an average of 1000 dollars per ton of fish if you average out over the very expensive and the really cheap ones so and and so 120 billion is pumped in but that is not all of it right when you get that fish it goes through the economy it adds value at every stage the wholesalers the retailers uh, the agriculture sector and then until you eat the fish there is added value if you take all that into account we are talking about 350 to actually uh, half a trillion dollars a year in terms of added value to the global economy. So this is not chicken change. Even for the U.S., this is a lot of money, right? I mean, so, yeah, and uh, so it's important economically. Then the jobs. This is really, this this thing really hit me hard when we, when we did this paper. We, we estimated 260 million people and some kind of income from ocean fisheries. And then we say, which are the top countries? If you look at these top countries, they are large developing countries. So you have tens of millions of young people, mostly men, who would have nothing to do if not for the fish. And to me, this is probably one of the, the, the most important service that the oceans give us. Just think of it. You have ten, tens of millions of young people who have nothing to do. The kind of headache we'll all have I made a joke when I gave a talk at the John Kerry uh, uh, conference on September 15th. I said, everybody is surprised how gray Obama has become in eight years. And then I said, if not for fish, I tell you the president would be gray. Not only him, all of us in the room, including me. <laughs> After that, somebody came and said, but you will never get gray. <laughs> no, I get gray, you just don't see it, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is such a big function that really we need to, to, to think. We need to keep the fish going just for the sake of these people and for us too because of the connections. The Europeans uh, know about these migrants, right? Migrants from West Africa, from Senegal, there are real evidence that a lot of them are from fishing communities where the fish is gone, right? So, yeah. How are we doing in terms of our interactions? It doesn't look good, right? You have empty nets, you have fish in the marrow food where you have pollution, plastic in the thing, you have oil spills, climate change, oh my dear. So there are lots of things happening, right? And, and that is uh, why we need to do, uh, to take this serious. And, and this is just connection from climate change, all the changes we're seeing, sea temperature rising, acidification, ocean current patterns, and, and your institute, you do, uh, many of you look at these issues there. Uh, and, and salinity. So, so you have all this happening on the physical and chemical side, and then they affect naturally the biology life in the ocean from the individual species right down to communities and ecosystems. And whenever I see this as an economist, I say it has to have impact on the fish economy, right? I mean, so just like the chemistry and physics affects the biology, the life, the biology is affected, it will affect the, the, the economy. So we do a lot of analysis of that in my, my group. Other, other types of unsustainable interactions, uh, some numbers from the literature, about 20% of the original area of coral reefs around the world is already lost, according to this paper, and that was in 2008. So it's quite uh, uh, an estimate which has gone past that. And sea grasses are disappearing at the rate of 110 kilometers per, uh, per square kilometer per, per year. So if we take an area, right, that's the loss according to that. And seaweeds in, in, in Zanzibar are dying, and there was a lot of complaints about this. And the connection is made to, to climate change. And for Zanzibar, uh, which is a, a small island part of Tanzania, Seaweed farming has become a lifeline for them, actually. 
small scale fishes, women, and, and uh, really f work in that sector. It's a lifesaver, and, and they got really hit recently. So, <laughs> habitat destruction you already know about. So, there are issues, essentially, that's, that's what I'm saying. And all these things are, are coming to, to bear on, on the ocean and what we take out of it. So, this is an estimate of the amount of, actually, this is a record from the FAO, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization the amount of fish we, we've been taking from 1950 since when they started collecting data. So we're taking roughly about 10 million tons or 10 million fish cows, right, then. And this has grown to about 80 million and new estimates, I said, especially on the unreported side, is showing it's, it's, it's a bit higher than this, but this is official data. So it's almost like we are stabilizing, but if you look at the amount of <coughs> we are taking out the fish, which is the machines and people, it's a way to summarize fishing capacity, it's been really going, going, going up, up, up. So you look at that, it's almost stable, if you are generous, because some estimates show it decline, whilst the effort is zooming. So every economist will tell you, when I see this, I know there's trouble, right? Because all the marginal effort that comes in after some point don't bring in anything. It's complete waste. So, so we just, you know, yeah. And why is this? Why is the effort increasing? It's partly because our tax money is going to support some of this through subsidies, right? All right, then uh, what I did after looking at that graph, I tried to really get numbers on, on the economics. I was lucky there's Blimsol, it's a company that puts together economic data on the 100, 1,000 largest fishing companies in the world who, that are traded on the market. So this is needed for investors, right? So I looked at the data. Uh, 1,000 top global fishing companies from 43 countries, including many of the leading maritime countries. Their total sales value a year is uh, 20, 21 billion. For, so for that year, that's about a quarter of the total, just to give you the the size of this group of companies compared to the total. And then we analyze their pre-tax profit just to see what is happening. And I'm going to give you a quick summary of that. Uh, this was published in, in 2012. And this here, if you look up on the y-axis, we are looking at uh, the percentage of the total 1,000 companies. So, so where you see 40%, that's 40% of the 1,000 companies, right? 400, if you like, that's on that axis. And here is the pre-tax profit, the pre-tax profit as a share of the sales, you know, of, of fish, and that is what you see. About 80% of all the companies, <clears throat> and if you do it by country, 80% of them actually report uh, almost zero, zero profit, just about zero profit, yeah, 80%. And you might say, ah, are they doing some tax rearrangement? You know, people can report so on and so forth. But then what gives me a bit of faith in these numbers is that actually they report these numbers in order to attract investors. And I don't think you say you're making zero profit or negative profit if you are, you know. So there is a bit of uh, confidence here. And see, in terms of countries, yeah. By the way, U.S. is one of the countries that still make money in the aggregate from, from its fisheries. But most countries don't. You have negative profit because that is covered by subsidies. I've talked about subsidies already, so let me give you a bit, a bit of data on that. We spend a lot of time looking at, at subsidies. Since the early 2000s, we have provided the world a global database, and we've been revising them. Uh, the latest one was published this year, actually. And we, what we do is we take subsidies and we classify them into these three groups. Because like everything, subsidies are not always bad, right? There is an economic basis for subsidizing something. And that is if that thing contributes to society in a way society defines. So whatever we find to be good and the market is not supplying enough of it, yeah, you can have society chip in, right? And uh, Karina, you are telling me about the ferry this morning, right? The ferry that takes people to the city. And, and, and that was taken because it wasn't making money and there was a bit of protest. So the, 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 the state or, or 
some authority took over, right? <laughs> because it's valuable for the community, CO2, instead of everybody driving. So that is where you can subsidize, and economic theory supports that. In terms of fisheries, if you are funding uh, monitoring of, of fishing and making sure people follow the rules, that is a good thing. Otherwise, everything just goes down the tube, right? So there is what we call beneficial subsidies or good subsidies. Then there is the bad ones, the capacity enhancing ones. The subsidies that make people fish harder than they would in the market situation. And fewer subsidies are the most typical of them. If somebody's paying 30% of your fuel bill, you are, you are going to fish more than you would otherwise. And uh, th there is a lot of evidence for this. One fuel prices were going up. In Malaysia, for example, they just had to tie. They had to tie their boats. They couldn't fish until they protested and the government gave them money to buy the fuel. Then, then it worked. So, so, and then we have the subsidies that we could not easily classify, so we call them ambiguous. Now, if you look at uh, uh, one of our latest uh, estimates, this is what you get. So annually, the, the world's people, I mean, taxes, our tax money, about 35 billion is given to, to the fishing sector. And out of this, about 60%, $20 billion is what we consider to be bad subsidies in the sense that they encourage overfishing. And the question is, why do you want to do that, right? So this is a big driver of the overfishing. So this is our estimate of where countries as countries are making money from their fisheries or not. So the more, the more red you are, the more, the more negative. Uh, and some countries, it's either no data or they are not coastal countries, right? So you see a lot of places is red. They, they're just not making money. <coughs> And you wonder why they are fishing, subsidies support this, and, and, and so on. And then in terms of uh, food security, we estimated how much we are losing because we are not ma ma managing our fisheries optimally. And our estimate then was about 10 million tons of fish that we could harvest if, we only, if only we manage our fisheries optimally to get the, the most in a sustainable way. So you take down, it's like a bank account, right? You have a bank account. If you take down the bank account, the interest that comes in is going to be less, right? So it's amazing how close economics and ecology are, you know, the, the thinking and the concepts. So 10 million fish cows gone because of bad management. And this has effect. In fact, what we did was to convert this to say, if this was, if we got this and we use it only to to support the nourishment of undernourished people of the world. How will that work out? 20 million people could be taken out of undernourishment. Yeah, so, so lots of waste in that sense. Yeah, that's the point I'm saying. 19, 20 million people, yeah, and, and lots of implications for food, especially in parts of the world where food is still a problem. So there are issues. The next question you ask is, should we rebuild or not rebuild? And people ask me this all of us. So if you say we should rebuild, like the court stocks of Newfoundland, you people have, you've heard about that? It, it kind of crashed. In 1992, they had to ban fishing. I mean, they didn't have to ban fishing. There was just no fish, so we had to stop in 1992. And they haven't really come out. We're beginning to see signs of them coming back, not, not close to anything before. And, and so when you are in that situation, do you want to try to rebuild the fishery or not? Usually people ask me, is it ecologically feasible? And, and, and in general, yes. If you leave nature alone, nature comes back, except you have destroyed the habitat and the system so much that there's no space. So that is uh, possible. And then people ask me, how much effort, fishing effort, do we need to cut? So this is a question of today and tomorrow, right? Okay. You, you rebuild, and we know that if you rebuild, we'll get more, but we have to live today. We have to keep fishing. We have to eat, and this is a real problem for the fishing community, and especially in developing countries, right? So that is a big challenge, how to soften the blow while the fish come back, and, and, and that's the question. And the question of how long. How long will it take? That's quite important, right? Now, the data and meta-analysis has shown that 
fish is dependent on the type of fish. It can take between four years and 26 years to rebuild uh, a depleted system, depending on the fish. So, so that that's, uh, can be a lot of time, but if it's highly productive, fast turnover, you can do it fast. So we have to take that into account. And then the question is, will the net benefits from rebuilding be greater than those of the status quo? And uh, that's a question I, I, we ask in the paper, and this is what, uh, what we see. Actually, our calculation is that we can turn every place black, actually, by rebuilding. If you were patient enough to rebuild and get there, then we can, we can do it. Because at the moment, our calculation is that we, the, the whole world is losing about, I think, about $12 billion if you subtract the subsidy we give them, right? $12 billion. If you rebuild, you can take down the subsidies and they will make even more money. question is how to do it, really, yeah. How do you really get movement? So improving ocean sustainability, and uh, I have a few, a few points here to make on um, what I think from our work so far. Yes, and this is a model I like a lot, actually. It's such a simple model, but it really summarizes. And I told you about the guy who said we could farm all the fish we need in one high-rise building. I, I believe that if that person understood this model, he would have asked that question. So think of it. So you have the ocean, or this can be the whole environment, actually. Almost all our relationship with the environment is that we take the things we like, the useful things, the good things, we take them from the ocean or from the environment, right? All the inputs to the economy, come from the environment, gold, water, fish, whatever. We take them in, and then we do all that we do with them, and what do we produce? We produce waste, and where do they go? They go back into the environment. So this model, actually, I think, we tweak around, we can improve, we can be more productive, but you cannot escape from this at the, uh, you know, as you go. And, and having this uh, in the mind, I think, is, is quite useful. Now, we have two types of economies. We, we talk about natural, uh, when it relates to the environment. We have natural resource economies, like me, I'm mostly that, I look at fish. And usually, resource economies will look at the way we take the resources we need from the environment and analyze it. How best do we do that? you know, to meet our needs without harming the environment. So that's that. Then the pumping out of waste, that is usually, they're called environmental economies. So they study the pollu pollution part. How do you optimally pollute? All the economists say this, right? Mm -hmm. And my, my ecological friends want to kill me for saying that. <laughs> say, Zero pollution is not available. I'm sorry, because once you breathe, there is some pollution. The question is, how do you do it optimally? <laughs> so, so they spend all their time trying to study that. And, uh, all right, so that's just the realization and understanding of this is, I think, is fundamental. If, the more we get people to understand this, I think the more we'll make headway, including president-elect. I think, I, I hope I could find a way to just show him this model. He probably will chase me out of the place, but. Yeah, yeah. You can just make up things. There's a limit, you know. Yeah. yeah. Now, ocean as a system, um, I, I, I think we really need to think out of the ocean as a system. All the boundaries we put around 200 miles, the fish don't actually know this. And even if they did, I wonder if they were respected, right? They go where they go. They don't need visa, right? They just go. Yeah. So, so if something happens in one part, it kind of reaches other parts, you know. When the, in, in Japan, when the, the, the earthquake, you have the nuclear meltdown and so on, I got tons of telephone calls asking me what is going to happen in Vancouver. All the, is the, is the, are the pollutants coming over, right? So people realize this connection and we, we need to really think of the ocean as a global system, at least at the high level. Of course we have to do the, the local level stuff too because they link up, right? It's just not ignoring that completely. And, 
uh, it's what I'm talking about. Now, thinking of the high Cs and the EEZs, uh, I should explain what EEZs are. They are, they, they are called the exclusive economic zones of coastal countries of the world. And at the United Nations UNCLOS, United Nations Law of the Sea, which was approved by most countries of the world in 1982, gave countries, coastal countries, the right to manage and, and keep people out of their exclusive economic zones. And, and that's, that's what this is. And the whole idea is we want to protect the fish. And 90% of the fish we catch comes within these 200 nautical miles, 90%, about 10% in the high seas. In fact, this is what has got me thinking about maybe closing the high seas to fishing, right? Because there's such low density of fish is two test of the whole ocean and the high seas, yet only 10% of the catch comes from there. So you can imagine the economics forgetting all the details. It means that a ton of fish caught in the EEZ will be cheaper and pump less CO2 than a ton of fish caught there, right? Everything being equal, you have to travel and search more. So, so, so that is uh, something to remember, yeah. High seas EEZs and their relationship. So one of the things we did recently is to try and say how much of the fish we catch, how much of it is fish that comes, that lives all their lives solely in the high seas, right? And then how much of the catch comes from solely the exclusive economic zones and how much is fish that straddle between the two areas, yeah. And what we found was quite amazing. Far less than 1% of our catch currently comes from, from fish that live all their lives in the high seas. And the majority are fish that straddle between the two areas, right? So this is, this is good information. So to me, what it says is if we agree, if the world agrees to close the high seas to fishing, the only thing we are sure we will not be able to catch is those less than 1% fish because if no boat goes there, you can't get it. But the 7 to 8% could be available fishing, uh, if that means we are using the high seas as a fish bank, where the fish get the peas, they grow, they, they spawn and give more eggs that float in and seed the, the exclusive economic zones, and then we catch them cheaply, right? And, and so, so this, this actually led, led, us to, led me to push for this idea of closing, and, and more work is coming uh, towards that. Let me just show you two pieces of, of uh, literature here. This is a paper by Costello from Santa Barbara in his postdoc. And this is from our group, and we looked at, they, they did a model of, of this and actually came to the conclusion that we will get more fish in the ocean, we will catch more fish, and we'll make more money if the high seas were close to fishing. It's a model. And then we went ahead and said, what are the losers? Because um, some countries will lose, some will gain it. And that is important for the politics. And if you look up here, at the moment, only 10 countries take about 70% of all the revenues from the high seas, which is supposed to be owned by all countries of the world. So, so clearly, these countries will not like this, right? <laughs> and so that was where the idea of, of uh, looking at um, the, the winners and losers came, came about. And the whole concept behind these papers is that, like I said, if we close the high seas, we allow the fish to grow, and they, they, they spawn more, they get bigger, and they come over, and then you can, you can catch them. So this is the situation. So you have good management there. And in one of our recent papers, we look at both closing and not closing, but managing as well as you can. And, and so you do that. You get more fish in here, because they have the piece to, to grow. And, and as the density increases, naturally, things at high density flow down to the low density. So we have fish jumping over. Beautiful. It comes to you. They almost jump into your boat, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, cheaply. So, so that is essentially the idea behind these two papers. And, and the first time I, I started thinking about this, I came back, I was coming back from a conference, climate change conference. 
And in the plane, I was just thinking, I said, we're pumping CO2, the fishing boats, the big ones go far and they pump more, more expensive. Maybe we should close the high seas. I started thinking about it. So when I came to our group, I was excited. Uh, I said, hey guys, let's do a paper to, to, to tell, show the world what this may mean. We may, it may be wise to close the high seas. And Daniel Pauli, somebody, some of, many of you will know here, when I told him this, he thought I was crazy, okay? So I've really pushed the envelope, right? Crazier than Dana Pauli. <laughs> so, so he told me, oh, Rashid, nobody will, will, will do this. I mean, come on, uh, food security and all that. So, but then I, I, I really couldn't let it go. And so I did an early paper together with the group. In 2005, we published where we said, if you close 10%, you lose X amount of dollars. If you close 20, 50, just to play around. And if you close, the whole thing, you, we lose only $1.35 billion. And then I said, given all that we'll get, it's probably not too much, you know. And then I left the paper out there. And this has slowly, is growing actually. In fact, HISIS MPA has just been declared in the Antarctica, right? The Ross Sea, you probably heard that, yeah. So there is some slow movement. John Kerry actually mentioned that in the, our oceans conference. He says, maybe that is where we need to go to really be able to meet what we need to protect in order to sustain our oceans. All right. So, rebuilding. Uh, uh, the question people ask me when I talk about the rebuilding, they say, if rebuilding is so good, why are we not rebuilding all over? And when I look at it closely, is the politics. The politics is hard. Because that means you have to reduce fishing, and you know it's not easy. California has been doing some good stuff, right, with MPA, marine protected areas, and in collaboration, as far as I understand, with the communities, right? So fishing communities, which is which is good. But the politics is hard, and this is where we come in, scientists, piling the evidence, making the arguments, helping those who want to do something, to be able to convince society to do something. The waiting time I've already mentioned, that is a problem. And uh, people always say, I, I gave a talk like, like this in Namibia and the, one of the fishers ministers, what will we do with all our poor fishers? Good question, right? So how to balance the now and the future is, is tough. Now, fixing the economics, uh, I, I, this is my, I really think that fishing should be profitable, otherwise it shouldn't happen. Yeah, some will kill me for this, right? You know, if you are going to use society's uh, resources, you better add value, right? The idea that taxpayers have to fund you to go and deplete a fish stock is a bit too much if you think of it. So the minimum requirement is, yeah, please make money or, or feed. Do get us some value rather than negatives and and no harmful subsidies, no bad subsidies, please, because you should use taxpayers' money to do the people's work rather than undermine their resource base, nature space. So that's one thing. And this is not straightforward. We've been fighting about subsidies for over 15 years now. It's gotten up into the public, uh, I don't know, if I is in the UN Sustainable Development Goals is one of the things they've committed to, 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 to try to do. So it's up there, but we need the final push to really get some action. So far, people are still giving subsidies. Illegal fishing, this is big. This is everywhere, even today. I have a map uh, where we, we actually mapped out places where uh, illegal fishing has been, uh, fishers have been apprehended, and it's almost everywhere except in New Zealand, you know, so, uh, and I, I recognize it because New Zealand is a small country somewhere. So I gave a talk and I said, you know, uh, it's happening everywhere. And there was somebody from New Zealand, she raised her hand, said, no, not in New Zealand, look at your map. <laughs> uh, and I said, I'm sorry, you are right. But maybe it is because you are good at hiding. <laughs> I know, I had to come back, you know, so. <laughs> So that was a, a nice exchange. So, so one thing we did recently, this is my postdoc, Dana Mina, we did a really cool piece of work. She was looking at how fishing boats get insurance coverage for their activity. 
and whether illegal fishing boats actually are covered. And what she uncovered was quite interesting. 40% of illegal boats actually get insurance coverage. And this is crazy, right? So, so it, it helps the economy. You can see sometimes when they are being apprehended, they abandon the boat and go, right? Because then they, can, they have that coverage. So this, this has been, it was very well received in the literature and in the media. And Dana is now working with uh, insurance companies in London because they were surprised too. Most of it is they just don't know. So we are advising them to try to check all the illegal fishing list and there are list around to make sure so any boat that is on that list is not giving insurance coverage. We need to make the economics not good for them. That's it. It's, it's pure economics. Yeah. Then, then there is cooperation and, and this is big. What we see is the race for the fish. You probably have heard that, right? The fish is not yours until you catch it and it's in your boat. So if there is no good management, no, no regulation, the tendency is for us to compete and take things out. Individually that is rational, but collectively it's always a disaster. You end up in the prisoner's dilemma situation. I'm sure many of you have heard about the prisoner's dilemma, right? where two prisoners were arrested, the police have weak evidence that they committed crime, but not strong enough. They can, they, can, they, can, they can jail them with the evidence. So they took two of them out into different cells and told them, if you, if you tell us you did it, and the other person doesn't tell us, you go free, and that person stays for many years, and vice versa, right? If both of you deny it, we'll put you in based on our weak evidence, so it will be very low. And, and, and that is if both of you deny it. And if both of you agree, you get a lower penalty. They all told on each other, yeah, because they didn't trust. If I did it and he doesn't, or she did. so So that is the prisoner's dilemma, and that's it. So one, one thing we are finding is the more you can get fishing entities to work together, the better, then you take that edge out, and that leads to better benefits for everybody, including the fish, actually, even the fish does well. This is a whole area, applying game theory to fisheries money. So we need to nudge people, uh, groups of people to work together. And, and there are many shared stocks, many shared stocks in the world. If you take the, what I mean by shared stock is when a fish is not living in your own 200 nautical miles throughout their life. If they move, like, like halibut or Pacific salmon, right? They go Canada, US. And so if Canada and US don't work together, we know the results is gonna go. Everybody is going to compete. So there is the Pacific Salmon Commission, which was put together to do that. Halibut Commission is another one. So there are countries that already apply this, uh, this idea because otherwise it doesn't work. My final slide, no, not actually, second to final slide, is about buying insurance, buy insurance through uh, the establishment of marine protected areas. Uh, biologists and ecologists like marine protected areas for, for various reasons, some, not all, not all. But uh, economists like marine protected areas because of the insurance value of that. The whole idea is you can try as hard as you can. You, it's hard to have perfect, effective fisheries management because of uncertainty in the way we measure stock assessment, in the way we manage. So if you have part of the ocean protected from our errors, that helps you with insurance. When you make a big mistake, you have part of the ocean to help you come back. So the insurance value is what makes, uh, makes me really in support of... Uh, of uh, marine protected areas. And coupled with all the things that are happening from climate change to overfishing and so on, you just, we virtually, we just need to hide some of the fish away from ourselves, you know? Yeah, just hide them away, at least for some time, come on. So, so that, was, that, uh, that is the, the whole thing. Now, in the final slide, I have two pictures for you all, close to final again. Yeah, I have two, two slides. I put these two pictures together because I think for me they tell all the story about why we need to sustain the ocean. You have
have that animal there hanging on the last eyes, virtually. You know, I mean, when you see an animal like this, how do you feel? I mean, you want to save that last last eyes, or or even grow it because it can squat on this for too long, right? <laughs> Not to jump up. So that is one reason why we, we really need to work harder to protect our ocean. And then you turn here, you see this couple, so happy to have their fish. So beautiful, isn't it? So for the sake of people and nature, I think we need to work hard to avoid ending up with the dead ocean. Because the dead ocean is going to be terrible. You can run all your cables or the ships on it, but we cannot get all the benefits we get now. So I thank you so much for your attention. And these are some of the people, my students and colleagues, over the years that we've worked together. Not all of them. I couldn't get them all on one slide. So thank you so much for your attention. now as we do uh, pretty regularly is we have some of our students ask a few questions uh, and interview our speaker and then we open up the um, floor to uh, questions from the audience. Wonderful. So um, if you would uh, wait a minute I'm going to introduce a couple of our students yeah. and we'll start that section. So these are two of our uh, hardworking graduate students mm -hmm. and passionate about the ocean yeah. and the uh, yeah, environment. I'd like to introduce Daniel Cox and Hi, my name is Daniel Cox, and I'm a grad student here at the Romberg Tiburon Center. And my research is focused on the mudflat invertebrates here of San Francisco Bay, specifically looking at the composition of na native and non native species. Hi, I'm Emily Lamb, and I'm in the Stillman Lab here at the Romberg Tiburon Center, and I'm looking at how climate change impacts the behavior and the neural physiology of porcelain crabs. Hi, I'm Rushi. I guess we're gonna, we're gonna interview him now and ask him a couple questions. Um, so I guess I'll start. Uh, my first question um, is, so Arctic ice is melting due to climate change and um, this is opening new regions of um, the ocean for fishing. What protections are in place to prevent overfishing and what impact does this have on indigenous culturally significant fisheries? Yeah, so, so the Arctic is, uh, is, um, is opening up and, and so there are big issues and this is one of them. And we have, when I, on the first page of my slide you see Ocean Canada, it's a, it's a partnership project that uh, we, we ran it from UBC made up of academics, government people, business and NGOs working together to deal with issues, not only in the Pacific and Atlantic, but also in the Arctic. And I think we got the money to do that because we had the Arctic in our proposal, actually, because it's so hot. So, so it's opening up, and that can be a problem. In the first place, at the moment, we don't understand much what is going on. In fact, if you look at official statistics from the UN, which is actually data that governments of countries give them, they don't, they don't look for data themselves. So the US, NOAA will give them uh, as the estimate of the catches and each country does that, Canada does. If you look at that, there is no any record of catch from the Arctic, at least on the Canadian side, which is surprising. So our group, Daniel led a group and we actually estimated there's a lot of fish being taken out by indigenous people and so on. So, so to start with, even the records are terrible. So we need to improve that. Now, there isn't much going on, but then in terms of policy, something happened uh, last year or last two years. Five Arctic countries, including the US and Canada, actually have taken out a part of the Arctic and saying no fishing there until we understand what is going on. So to me, that was one of the most uh, nice things to happen. So they went ahead of the curve, so no fishing here until we understand. So that is still, that is in force. And they're trying to get other big nations to sign on. It's just the five, right? So that is a good sign. 
Now, in terms of the impact on uh, Aboriginal people, uh, there is a lot of fear among Aboriginals, actually, about what this is likely to do to their livelihoods that they get from fish. Because once it opens up and the big commercial, big boats come in, they just get run over, actually. And this is a big issue. And we hope to, to shed more light on this and to alert Canadians to the consequences of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smila, for your presentation today. Um, you brought about the subject of the high seas, and um, a closure of these high seas fisheries would reduce the consumption of fossil fuels, uh, typically paid for with harmful subsidies. Could savings from these fossil fuel subsidies be used to invest in aquaculture and research into better management? That, that is good, you know. So the high seas fishing, uh, in terms of pumping of CO2, just general data, uh, Peter Tidemeyer is a professor at Dalhousie. He did an estimate. It's a bit dated, but that's the latest that I think is in the literature. The estimate is that about 1% of the CO2 that is pumped out is pumped out by the fishing sector of the world, 1%. Uh, that sounds like too little, but you know, one percent plus one percent before you know it's hundred percent. So, so that is something, and a lot of that is actually boats that go far, big boats, and so on. So, uh, that that is something we need to watch, and that is why part of the reason we are asking for really reducing fishing at the minimum in in the high seas. So, yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, so climate change is also going to shift uh, fish populations to new geographic locations and um, areas that have um, uh, coastal fisheries, some will be losers and some will be winners in, um, due to these changes. And I wanted to know how fisheries managers can um, plan for strategic use of these habitats and what incentives we can use uh, to promote sustainable fisheries in these regions. So as, as I'm sure you, you, many of you know this, the fish are moving, and the general scientific findings are that they are moving from the middle of the, the globe to the poles, you know, because it's getting too hot, right? Fish, like all of us, we have our thermal, the, the range that you feel. You, here, if we're too hot, what do we do? We put the air conditioner. The fish don't have air conditioners, right? So, so they either move, or they perish, and, and a lot of the movement is towards the poles. And this aggravates the world's, the issues I raised in terms of the jobs, the people who are hanging on that, in terms of the food. Food is moving away, um, places where people are not well nourished to, where we are struggling to make sure we don't overeat, right? So that is an issue. But here, what really worries me is that if you look at the ocean acidification literature, the Arctic, for example, is considered to be one of the hot spots. It's going to be relatively, it's going to acidify more than the tropics. So I characterize this as, it's almost as if the fish are running away from boiling water into acidic water. Can you imagine that? So, so that, that worries me a lot because then it, it messes up the winners and losers equation. And, and, and the first run, Vicky Lam, you said you're a Lam, right? My, my PhD student, she's now a postdoc, she actually studied that. And what she saw is that the fish movement will be a good thing for the Arctic countries, at least in the short term. But then when you bring in ocean acidification, it takes down the expected increase due to warming. Uh, but it's not completely bad because so far we don't see it the acidification effects over overdoing the movement effects. So there will still be a net gain, but it's just smaller. The tropics are just messed up. And, and so you connecting to your point about subsidies, what can you do in terms of preparation and, and management? So you use subsidies to prepare communities to be able to face this, these changes. In fact, I came up with an idea, and so far I published it as a paragraph in a paper. I think I should, I should have made it a full paper. I call it um, 
climate endowment fund. You know, essentially, you, you look at the fishery and say, make an estimate of your projected losses in revenues and incomes for the community, and then start putting in almost like savings, right, in preparation to make up for the loss in income. So it's almost like an, a retirement fund. So, so you could do that for climate also and, and then prepare people. So there are lots of innovative ideas that are in there. But to be able to do that, there is an issue that we probably need to deal with as a society. And that is that we're really good at reacting to problems, but not very good at being, what? Well, it's a word that is good. Being uh, pre, nope, eh? proactive. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. So just just being proactive and, and being ready. You know, in, in Canada, when the cost stock started going, scientists were sounding alarm. There's a problem, and nobody will do anything. Where will we get money? What will we do with the people? But when the fish crashed, suddenly there was two billion dollars to try to adjust people. A fraction of that would have saved us from all this pain. So how do you get the system to be able to be more proactive or reactive? Than, than, yeah. Thank you. Satellites and other shipping traffic, ship track, tracking technologies have been compiled in programs such as SkyTruth to monitor fishing activity. Can t new data from these programs on illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing be used to make better predictions on the costs and benefits of a high seas closure? Yeah. Yeah, this, is, this is a good one. The, there is this Global Fish Watch, uh, which was launched in September, actually. <coughs> it's a group of uh, people in, in the Bay Area using satellite technology to try to count the number of boats fishing in the high seas from the satellite and their sizes. And we are collaborating, actually, with them, with them and with Chris Costello and his group, with Enric Sala of National Geographic. We are doing exactly that, using their technology to help us estimate the cost of fishing out in the high seas and matching it with the revenue they get to do a better prediction of the profitability with and without subsidies, so we can actually uh, reveal to the world a better picture of the economics of this, and almost surely to show the world how unwise it is actually to fish on the high seas. Yeah. Thank you both, uh, Danny and uh, Emily. Uh, very much for your questions. We're going to turn up the lights a little bit and open up the audience uh, for questions. So if you have a question. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smiley, for the very helpful and informative presentation. I have a general question um, on the economic um, dollar amounts, uh, I guess I, the dollar amounts that you presented in the various slides. Um, that shows the economic impact associated with um, the kind of like invest now or don't worry about um, anything and just invest in the future. I'm kind of curious about, you know, I can appreciate there's a lot of complexity behind how you calculate uh, the, those values, but given the um, outcome of um, our uh, presidential election, I could imagine that that would be uh, Pretty, pretty quickly we'll have economists who would question the parameters and algorithms that you've used to carefully calculate these values. So looking ahead and also wondering in the past when you have had what governments or fisheries and other people who would have who might have disagreed with your conclusions, how have you dealt with those situations? Do you do you invite um, other economists, or do you invite the scientific community to validate the specific parameters that you use to calculate those algorithms in the first place? Thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks for the question, because we do get 
pushbacks. There's no question about that. And the big one is on our subsidies work. It, it really, because the way we do the, the subsidies database, we go out, we look through, and fish out, fish out all the data we can get from public sources, from literature and all that. And then where we know a country gives a certain type of subsidy and we don't have data. So somewhere in the literature somebody says, they do give, say, US gives fuel subsidies, but there's no data. Then we do our algorithm and estimate it, and this is controversial, right? It's an estimate, and they always go after me for this, right? And, and they say, oh, Rashid, your numbers are crazy, they're, they're useless. I say, okay, sir, you know, I'm not tied to these numbers. You know the correct number, just give it to me. I'll put it, I'm, I'm not tied to this. So, oh, but I don't have any number. How do you know my numbers are not good then? <laughs> so it's quite nice, you see the dynamics, it's quite, it's quite, and sometimes actually some of them give me good numbers, so, so there is that dynamics. Now, in terms of how I've dealt with, usually, like you, our group, we just keep piling the evidence. We do our best, just keep working. They, they argue until they cannot argue, and you have to get other people involved, like you said. Uh, partnership with other colleagues to do it. That is why we are working with, with Santa Barbara, National Geographic, it's not only Rashid talking and, and that helps. There's one incident which I had, this was in the British House of Commons. The G20 countries invited four scientists to give a talk to government members, parliamentarians and ministers. And I talked about subsidies and there was the Speaker of the House of Representatives in Indonesia. He went after me like crazy. <laughs> he said, Rashid, we will continue to give subsidies because we want to help the poor. We want to help the small scale fishers. And all I could tell him at the time is, sir, if you want a foot soldier to, to, to help reduce poverty, you can come and take me along. But this is not how to do it. If you use subsidies that undermine the resource that people rely on, you are really not helping them. Now, I did that, it was quite interesting after that. After that, he actually invited me to come and give a talk at his parliament in Indonesia. And, and then, but what that did to me is, I decided to look into the distribution of subsidies. Because all we do is national numbers. So US, we say X number of dollars. Canada, this, uh, so. So my PhD student, Anna, she's now finishing, she's about to finish. What she has done is to take the national estimate and get into the literature, this is hard work actually, to split how much of it goes to small scale versus high scale, country by country. And we're going to report this number soon. I wish I had that. Indonesia, less than 10% of the subsidies goes to small scale. It goes to the big guys, you know. So that is the way you, you take the information and you do something more. And, and very soon we'll be publishing globally uh, the estimate Anna is coming up with is that only 16% of the 35 billion I told you goes to small scale. When they land, more than half of the fish. So if you do it per kilo, it's almost, I think, one to seven or so of subsidies going. So this is, you just have to keep going and answering back and proving yourself. Oh, this is fun job. Brazil, you know. They came. To, they went after me when we published one of our. They said, Where did you get these numbers? You don't know anything. You have to our people, and we really very meticulous with our appendix, so we, all the sources. So I got the email. I checked my appendix. Actually, it comes from the Ministry of Fisheries of Brazil <laughs> <laughs> on their website. So I just copied the thing and said, "Here it is." I didn't hear from them for a while. The next thing they said. They invited me to come and give a talk in Brazil. Yeah, so it's amazing, actually. Yeah. I saw you. Um, if, if you would like-minded uh, scientists can make your case for closing the high seas to fishing, mm -hmm. uh, which, which shape does the, what shape would that take? Is it a, is it a treaty? Is it a legal framework? Mm. Uh, how, does it, how would it work? How would it come together? Yeah. And this is a difficult question that uh, mostly I don't think I can answer fully because I came from it from the economics and ecology side. So we show that if you are able to do it, this is what it will bring in. Now, what that has done is we are getting activities. Jennifer Jacket, she's an assistant professor at New York University. She has just got a project to 
actually look at the legal aspects of this. How do we get this to work? It's a three-year project, she just started, and uh, so it's stimulating different groups to really start looking, looking at this, yeah. One of the guys who went after me was a Russian official on the Global Ocean Commission. I don't know how many people have heard about this. It was put together by five NGOs to, to try to raise the profile of high seas management uh, a few years ago. And they got really high level um, ministers and so on, including John Podesta before he was called back by Obama to come and be chief of staff, right? So I had lunch with him, and the next week he was, he was back in the White House, actually. And he, he people like that, high-level people, uh, David Miliband, former secretary of uh, Britain, Ma Nelson Mandela's first financial sec finance, minister of finance. So these are really high-level people, and, and they look, looked, looked at that, and, and, and so what, I was just trying to give you some background information. And, and so there, there was a lot of activity raising the profile of the high seas fisheries, which is leading to a lot of action here. Yeah. And that Russian minister, he didn't want to talk with me. When I did this, we met later, and he said, you know what, I talked about what you're saying. Maybe we should close the areas that are not currently managed at all. So there was movement, even from him, right? So. Bit hopeful. Yeah. Yes. There's somebody there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Should I share? Your choice. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, so interesting. And you've talked about the fish in the open ocean versus the coastal. And two weeks ago, I was at a talk. It was um, a panel discussion headed by Sylvia Earle, and it was put on by the Pew Charitable Trust, and it was about forager fish foraging fish, like um, krill and herring and yeah, sardines. And the collapse of that and how it feeds the entire f uh, food chain along the fish. So I'm just wondering what your comments might be on that. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing, of course, is that something like 85% of it now is being fished. Yeah, yeah so this is a very interesting question about uh, food webs in the marine ecosystem, right? I think the animals are all connected. So anchovies are there, they're eaten by another one and so on. So if you pull out the, the so-called forage fishes, you're really impacting the whole, the whole ecosystem because those who eat them will starve off, have to find something, and those they eat may become more, right? So, so that is the function of uh, forage fish. And actually, I was part of a group led by uh, Ellen Pickish. Yeah. Uh, she, she did, we did a paper where we look at the value of forage fish. And what we found is that it's better to let the other fishes fish the forage fish than we fish them. Even if you look at the economics, yeah, you, you get. So what we did is we did models that we, we take out or, or reduce forage fish and see what happens to the whole ecosystem the biomasses and the catches, and then we calculated the value against if they were there. And uh, <coughs> the value is, is better for the fish to fish. Yeah, forage fish is so uh, good point. Uh -huh. so, <coughs> so you want to go and then we come to you. Thank you for an edifying talk. My name's David McGuire, and I run a local group called Shark Stewards and Shark Conservation, primarily regulating the shark fin trade here in the US, but also internationally now. And we also work with Karina and others here with NOAA and Cal Academy of Sciences on creating marine protected areas, actually now communicating the importance. But the marine protected areas off our coastline are pretty well done. The science is getting better. We have something like 16% of no-take reserves on our coastline because we have the economics and we can enforce it. But economic-based uh, protection is important as well, as well as ecological. We have the wherewithal in the US where it's difficult in other nations. But when we're talking about the global ocean where there's very little regulation, um, I think in, in the IUU, it's really the unreported as you pointed out. I, I also work in Malaysia and Indonesia where it's really it's a wild, wild west. There's no regulation, there's no fisheries data. So uh, 
when we're trying to protect the open ocean, the problem is most of the value of the fish are going to the higher income status nations. So yellowfin tuna, big eye tuna, shark fin, swordfish. I think you said 10% of the fishing, but it's over 50% of the economic value. So whatever the numbers are, I mean, I, I know you're dealing with a lot of data with a, lacking a lot of, I mean, you're, you're trying to deal with fisheries data globally, but perhaps we should be thinking about ecosystem-based management approach in the open ocean and also migratory pathways for some of these species. Because as you know, like in the South China Sea, there are a lot of problems with EEZs. So we can protect spawning grounds, but maybe we're not protecting areas where animals are, are migrating through. So I thought, you, could you comment to that? Thank you. Yeah, the first one about management around the world, that is a big problem. I mean, if you go to Southeast Asia, you have examples, you go to West Africa, some of the big problems they have is they don't have the means to really monitor the EEZs. It's, it's very difficult. And one of the ways I've actually been advising when I go to the continents is actually, like if you look at the Benguela current system, that is fished by South Africa, Namibia, and Angola, each country is trying to monitor their own part. And what I say is this is one ecosystem. You have to think ecosystem-wide. How about the three of you pull together resources, because then you can monitor better the whole system. And, and the Namibians, they now have what they call the Benguela Current Commission, where they try to do this in West Africa. In different parts, you could do that, just to get local resources to kind of scale up and, and do more. Now, your, your point about other ways of management, definitely, definitely. Closing the high seas or closing in an area is not going to do it alone. It has to be combined with all sorts of other management. You know, we have some scientists saying, oh, if you close the high seas and the fish come out, they just get whacked. I mean, if you do that, yes, they will get whacked. You have to manage what happens outside the NPA, otherwise nothing happens. So you can have pathways that are protected within EEZs, and then that links up with the larger closure, if, if, if it ever comes into fruition, yeah. But, uh, mm -hmm. There's somebody who was trying, really, yeah. Uh, hello, thank you for your speech. Yeah. Um, feel free to take any route to answer this question. Republicans do not acknowledge environmental problems, and they now take over the House, the Senate, and presidency. How do you think this will affect the environment on a global or country, or country scale? Oh my god. <laughs> Oh my God, this is so so difficult. It's so difficult because you don't even know where the man stands, right? I mean, it's keeping all of us in suspense, you know. Uh, I, I'm not optimistic, I mean, I'm not, because, you know, like I mentioned, the John Kerry uh, Oceans meeting, it's amazing what they've done these three years, just bringing academics, policy people, philanthropists together, committing. I don't think that is going to happen in this government. They, they wouldn't want to talk to us. I mean, Obama was there, John Kerry was there, and the celebrities were there, and the scientists were all in the same room. I was just two chairs away from Mr. President, right? And, and I, don't think, I don't think they would want to see us. I don't know what will happen. These guys don't care about science, do they? Do they? No. So, so I'm a bit worried. But you know what? Ultimately, where is Adri Adria? Is it Adria? She said, you know, yeah, you know, don't worry, Rashid. We didn't elect a king. We elected a president. And somehow we will make him answer. I love that. <laughs> yes, I mean, get the power. You can just, yeah. It's not, it's not running Trump Tower. It's running the country. And you can't just do it your own way. So that gives me a bit of optimism, yeah. Oh, one last one. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Yeah, no. So uh, I'd like uh, your thoughts about how much uh, we should preserve in marine protected areas. And our parochial model here in California is we, we have uh, our eldest reserves now 13 years old. We shut down 25% of fishing. And in the deep water, uh, the top species have recovered to the tune of 270%. But the rest of the state, we're only at 16%, as David said. Mm -hmm. So do you have a metric for how much should be put aside in mm. marine reserves? Mm. Yeah, you know, there's a paper which appeared, I believe, either early this year 
or late last year by Callum Roberts and his group. What they did was to look at a meta-analysis of all that scientists have said about the optimal size of MPAs. So, and they, they, they did that, and the number they came up with is 30%. That's on average of all scientists what they've said. There's a range, of course, but that's the middle number. So that's probably where to start, the best size. Did you say the last yeah, one? I think we had a long night. So um, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, and thank you, Rashid, for a wonderful talk. Very informative. And uh, we hope we'll see you here again soon. We have Discovery Day. Where we'll have another public forum in the spring. And we have some newsletters on the way out, if you'd like to grab some of those, hot off the press. And thank you once again very, very much, everyone.